Hi, welcome to another episode of our entrepreneur interview series. And today I have Yolandi Hamilton, who's a personal style and confidence coach. And she's got some great tips that she's going to share her three step method to intentionally up level your style and a great freebie that she's going to give you later in the episode. So stay listening to get those. Yolandi is a personal style and confidence coach with 16 years of industry experience. She's been seen in InStyle, Bustle, TLC, Psych Central, and Thrive Global, and now serves ambitious women to unpack, release, and heal from their style history by combining psychological principles and tools with styling theory and techniques so that they feel liberated, in control, and confident in their style, body, and life. And I honestly can't wait to hear what you share because I'm one of those people that I always wanted to be like a fashionista and I am not. So anything that can give me tips on how to feel more confident when when I put on my clothes for work or for just going out and being in life is great. So thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited. I want to start first, like we do all of these interviews, by asking you to share how and why you started this business. The how is a very lifelong sort of disjointed journey that until I look back, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. I never really saw the, all the connecting points that really pushed me towards this area of expertise. Um, even though I feel like I kind of had a slight natural aptitude for it, They're, everybody's born with that thing, you know, that they're good at. And mine just happened to be clothes. I played with Barbies a lot as a kid. I loved dressing up. You know, I was always in the dress up trunk at you know school and th the young years. And as life progressed, I found that the most poignant moments in my life all revolved around clothing and how I was dressing myself and what that did to me internally, not just how I looked and in, looked back on photographs and, you know, memories of like, you know, oh, you remember when I wore that dress to that party? Like, it was so much fun. It was, oh, I remember when so-and-so said that, you know, I was a copycat in eighth grade because we wore the same outfit on the same day and I was the less popular one. And I felt like crap. Those were the things that I really remembered. Couple that with a contentious divorce and 16 years of watching women day in and day out in my retail career. My uh, expertise was visual management. So I did all the displays, all the mannequins. Um, if something was dressed really well in the store that I worked in, I was the one who was responsible for it. And so people naturally assumed that, oh, well, you know how to dress the mannequins. You must know how to dress all of the people too which at first was not true. It was an acquired skill. Everyone's body is a little different. Everyone's uh, taste is a little different. And so through the years, I learned how to figure out what their taste was, what worked on their bodies, and then started to see those same patterns of thought erupt that in working on myself through, especially through my divorce, I noticed how we would think about a situation, for example, and we would either place the blame externally on like, you know, why is the world doing this to me? Why is it their fault? Or why is it not going the way that I want? We did the same thing with our clothes that people would come in and they would be like, oh, well, you know, I can't wear that because, but they were completely inane reasons. There was nothing logical about it. Like, I, you know, I can't shop at this store because I'm too old. And it was like, who's looking at the label inside your pants? <laughs> Are you walking with them inside out? So I made all these observations and started to build these connections between things that had happened in my life and how we process not only our own personal identities, but the situations that we find ourselves in and how those contribute to our identity, identities and how the two relate. And so the business was born. It was help women figure out what in their history is holding them back or continue to push this consumerist engine forward of the next newest thing that people think they need or they're told that they need because a new trend list came out in a magazine this month and now they're you know searching the stores for it so that they don't feel excluded you know fomo is a real thing that we all succumb to so i decided ultimately 
helping them solve their issues was where my heart was at. And that's what I needed to do. And here we are. So when I wear something that, that I like wearing, when I look in the mirror, I think I look good in it, which nobody else may think I look good, but I don't care. I think I do, including, you know, down to like your undergarments and your socks. And if you're wearing things that make you feel good, you tend to like project that. Like, like I like this blouse. It's got pretty colors and flowers and I'm real big on it's movable and stretchy and <laughs> not constricting. Practical. <laughs> Practical. It's also the opposite if you're wearing something that you have some kind of thought of, oh, I shouldn't be wearing this, I'm, I'm too old. This color doesn't look good on me. This shape of clothing doesn't work with my body. If you get any of that in your head, that projects outwards too. Exactly. It's, you know, sometimes you have to just be like, but wait a minute, I like, I like this piece of clothing. I don't care if somebody looks at it and thinks it makes me look square or boxy or like a Volvo, I don't know, you know, (laughs) that's not easy to do. And especially when you're an entrepreneur and you're kind of the face of your brand, you need to be able to project the image that you want people to associate with you. So that can be really important. Yeah. And especially in the case of marketing your business, because there is this perception of what successful looks like, right? Especially, you know, if you're a millennial and older, we grew up with this very traditional, like suits are professional, button downs are professional. And if you're not, you know, dressed like this, then you probably aren't the person for the job or, you know, for me to trust with my money and whatever your expertise is. And so we adopt these ideas, like you said, of what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, But when that doesn't really line up with authentically who you are as a business person, as an entrepreneur, and what your business stands for, then you will absolutely project that outward and they will, they'll feel the dissonance and they may not be able to like put their finger on what exactly is bothering them. But when they have, you know, a consult with you, they're going to feel like, okay, something is missing here or they're hiding something. And I don't know what it is that they're hiding but I just don't think that it's right for me to work with them. And it could be just as simple as you tried to pigeonhole yourself into this buttoned up, super professional image. That's not you. That's, you know, and you need to be more fun. I love pointing to um, her handle on Instagram is pure Gallus social. I think it is. And she wears right, like all these like funky colors of like overalls and sunglasses. And her hair is always like very interesting. Visually, she is just enough to take in all by herself that whatever content she's producing is like secondary that I'm always like, what is she wearing today? Very interesting. But her whole platform is that you have to stand out and be different. And she's not afraid to do that. And so she's not only talking the talk, she's also walking the walk in what she wears every single time you see her. She's not showing up in a navy, you know, suit. She's showing up in bright pink overalls with a yellow shirt and a big red bow in her hair all at the same time. And it's just liberating for her to, you know, address her people as she really is. And people resonate with that authenticity. And that's so important, especially as an entrepreneur, that people authentically can see who you are, what you stand for, and how you operate and move through the world, because that's what people are drawn to. People are drawn to working with people, not businesses and corporations. That's why corporations try to be more like people. In my past corporate career, I felt some of that dissonance myself because they did expect pretty much, you know, that you could wear corporate casual. The guideline was usually, if you think like a suit, either a skirt and jacket and shirt or pants and jacket and shirt, you can only dress down one of those three was kind of the definition of casual. So you could wear like khakis and a jacket and a shirt or maybe get away with more like a t-shirt or or something more like this, a little bit casual with the jacket and the skirt. So coming from a very creative field, marketing and a very creative background, I've been an artist all my life. Marketing itself is a very creative field. Yet I had to like kind of pigeonhole into, you know, I couldn't have pink hair. The only reason I don't have pink hair at the moment, besides the fact that my husband's kind of like, why would you not pink hair? But I'm like, you're colorblind and you won't know anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But was because, I mean, I would have had pink hair like 
for years or purple or blue but you know that wasn't going to fly in the corporate world and even i have a tattoo and it's hidden under shirt on my back because the corporate world would have frowned on it if it was at that time somewhere like my wrist where it could be seen or my ankle we actually had one of the places i worked you had if you had a tattoo that did show past your sleeves or above your sock past your slacks you had to cover it with something like a band-aid i always kind of felt like part of me was stifled and i felt like people could almost see that when they looked at me even though i was dressed completely appropriately i'd have on business casual you know jacket maybe casual slacks and a shirt but yet it wasn't reflecting me. It was reflecting the business. There's something to be said for that as well, but it definitely was not reflecting me. I've felt that and try to get away from that, but yet it's so ingrained in me from all the years that it's still sometimes hard. Before we sat down, I'm like, I had on it just a t-shirt. You know, I work from home. I've got shorts on, <laughs> you know, and and my shoes that I wear around the house, they're, they're Tom's, completely appropriate, but still I'm like, I had on a t-shirt and I'm like, I'm going to change this t-shirt because this is not what you wear when you're doing the interview. I still get that and have a hard time getting away from it. It's one thing to do something like when you changed your shirt to do it because you feel like you want to look more you or like you, it gives you a boost, you know, as opposed to like, oh, I have to do this because that's what's expected. And that's where that dissonance really comes in is when it's because you're doing it as an expectation that others have on you, then that's when they feel that you're under pressure. They can see you're under that pressure. Even if, like I said, they don't know what it is exactly. They're like, well, something's weird there, but okay, I don't know what it is. And they move on with their lives. They may not give it a second thought, but that's most likely what it is. It's still there subconsciously. <laughs> so COVID that we've all been dealing with a couple of years now, and it looks like we probably will for a while. How did that impact your business, if it did at all? So COVID is really the, the spur for giving me the push to go all in on what I'm doing now. It was one of those things that you kind of do on the side and like help people. I had a lot of family and friends who would always, you know, ask for my help. And, you know, they would tell people, you know, I know someone who knows someone who knows someone kind of a thing. And then everything completely locked down and shut down. And I was like, I have a, a choice to make, which like I mentioned, I was like, I can go back to the day job and keep this, you know, as just side stuff that I do, or I can go all in and it's going to be really scary and it's going to be really hard, but I'm not going to hate myself after working nine hours a day on someone else's dream and someone else's vision of here's what we want to sell this month. I just realized there had to be a better way. And so I decided, let's take the better way. I don't know exactly when we're going to take this better way, but this is what's coming. So I started making all the plans, you know, you start doing the research and filing the forms and all the things to make it official, official. And then things opened back up gradually. And I went back into work and I was there maybe two weeks before I went. Yeah, uh, the something that's got to give is going to give right now. <laughs> We're done. And, but I hung on just a little bit longer because it was still one of those, it was scary. You, you just don't know. There's so much that's unknown. I had one of those mornings, you know, where, um, and I don't know if you remember this commercial. This, was, this is a very old commercial. It's probably 10 plus years old now. It was a monster.com commercial. And the woman is sitting in her car in the parking lot and she just grabs the steering wheel and she's got a blank stare on her face. And all of a sudden she just screams. And they were like, do you feel like this on Monday morning? And I, it was exactly how I felt. I was like, I can't go in there one more day. And I was like, universe, work with me. Give me a sign that I need to leave this place. And so I walked in and I was in, in there maybe five minutes before the fire alarm went off. <laughs> <laughs> That's a huge sign to get out. <laughs> I was like, okay, I got you. Noted. So we all had to evacuate and come to find out there was a gas leak in the building. So we had to shut down for the day. And I went home and I was like, okay, I get it. It's time to go. But I still, I hesitated. And a week and a half later, I came down with COVID. And I was like, okay, you have made it very clear universe that it is time to go, that I need to just put that to bed. And so I, I let it go. 
And I focused on building what now I call the Mind Your Style six-week style and confidence experience, which covers all the mindset and, and the fun things with cleaning out the closet. And, and I really made it an experience. And it's evolved a little over time, but that was really the push was the fire alarm and getting sick with COVID that made me like grab the bull by the horn, so to speak, and just go for it. And it's one of those things that as an entrepreneur, I know, you know, anyone who's in their business now, full-time listening will know when you had that moment where you were like, okay, enough is enough. And until you reach that enough is enough point, you just kind of are like, you know, oh, this is really annoying and I hate it, but you put up with it. And I had reached that point. I was like, I am done. And so I took all the expertise that I had and created this, this little baby of mine, Hamilton Styling. What I find so interesting is that, you know, you had two very visible, aware in your face, <laughs> you know, a fire alarm saying, get out of the building, and then COVID saying, stay home. <laughs> and I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs that are doing their business, their baby on the side. It's their side hustle. A lot of questions come up about when should I leave? Most of the entrepreneurs are looking at things like, do I have enough savings in my savings account to carry me because your business is not going to be profitable on day one? That is not realistic. And some of them probably draw it out longer than they need to, or, or they, you know, want the insurance. And so they're staying in that position to have the medical insurance until they can get on their spouse's plan or find alternate insurance policy. And it's a huge question and you never know if you chose the right time when you're doing it, when you're in it, even when it's something as visible as a fire alarm saying, you know, get out of the building. <laughs> but out of all the entrepreneurs I talked to, none of them have said, I wish I waited longer. It's one of those things that when you're doing it part-time on the side, you know, you really have limited resources of time. You may have extra money to put into it because you're, you have steady income coming in, but your resource of time is probably even more valuable. And then once you quit your job and you go all in and you have the time to focus on it is when you start seeing more results. So let's talk about when you started your business, because we talk marketing, what were your biggest marketing issues at that time? Oh my gosh. Nobody had told me how difficult it would be to find your voice and make sure that voice is aimed at the right person. And that still, honestly, is something that I go back and forth on. Like, it's one of those like, oh, I figured it out. And then you're like, well, wait, have I? Have I actually figured it out? Because you evolve and you change. Your business evolves. It changes. And people that you're you know, targeting, they evolve and they change as well. And so you've got a threefold, you know, evolvement and changes happening all at once. And then you constantly have to uh, evaluate, is this still relevant? Is this still me? Is this still, you know, what I stand for as a business? Is this still where I'm coming from? What's my, my point of view here? And that is a whole sea of trial and error that I had no idea I was in for. It felt like one of those, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of moments. I was like, I just need to put it out there and it'll all work out. But it, it's so much more targeted and specific than if you build it, they will come. It's if you build it and you tell the right people, they will come. And that was something nobody told me. That is a, a good um, struggle that most entrepreneurs have at the beginning. I'm constantly updating my brand voice and your, your brand messaging is a huge, important part of your brand. People tend to think, oh, logo. That's usually one of the first things you do. I got to get my logo. And that's a very visually important piece of your brand because it's the consistent piece that people visually see. Yet the brand messaging and brand voice is the piece that connects with your audience. When we do branding for a client, we spend more time on the brand voice than we do the logo. We spend plenty of time on the logo and the colors and the design, but the brand voice and messaging takes longer to fine tune. And like you, I'm constantly updating mine and tweaking it. And that's something that I see two different struggles. Either the entrepreneur holds back and waits and thinks I have to have it all perfect 
before before I delve in. And that is that will kill your business. Yep. It's better to do something, anything than do nothing. Or they think, well, I've said it and I can't change it now. Yet one of the great things about the digital world and digital marketing is that we can get so much feedback on whether what we're doing is working. You can take that feedback and constantly you can do A B testing and you can constantly tweak and fine tune what you're doing to make it better and better. And you should be doing that. It is an evolution and a process. And what you're doing and saying today in a year's time, it's probably going to be slightly different again. So that's a, a good point is that you have to spend strategic time thinking about that. If all you can do at first is, is put it out there, you put it out there. But then you have to have some time with yourself or with an expert figuring out, is that what I want to say? Is it the right thing to say? Is it directed to the right people? Is that what they need to hear? And really fine tune that. Good that you've learned that process early so that you can be making those changes from the beginning. And that's the other thing I will add with that whole process is ask an expert, even if it's just their minimum base, like one hour consultation. There are lots of those with marketing experts. And maybe you've even got something like that just to get yourself pointed in the right direction. Because if you know you want to go to California, but you don't have a map, all the road signs have been removed and you're just driving aimlessly on roads that feel like they're headed in the right direction. You might end up in California. You might also end up in Texas and you could, depending on where you're starting from, you know, end up on, on the other side of New Jersey. You really want someone to give you that direction and help you find where it is you need to go. Because like I said, I first went through the trial and error. I learned the hard way of like, oh, I can figure this out. It's not that difficult, but it was that difficult. It was a headache that I could have avoided had I just asked somebody who knew. So if you're in that space and you're sitting around waiting to perfect your brand voice or your marketing message or your strategy, just ask an expert. Devour freebies. That, that's the other thing is find someone who teaches what you need and resonates with you. Devour their freebies, whatever content they're putting out there and find your time as soon as you can financially make that available to talk with them and get their guidance because that will save you so much time and money in the long run. I cannot stress how important that is. Yeah, that's exactly why we have our full blown branding packages. Someone starting out and we realize may not be able to afford that. We have full blown fractional CMO where companies will hire us to consult with them and direct their marketing for, for them or for their marketing team. And on that program, that's why I offer one hour consultations. Because you may not be at the point yet where you can afford the full-blown branding package, which is understandable. You start where you start. And you may not be able to afford the full-blown ongoing fractional CMO service. But we'll sit down for an hour and talk through what you need to talk through and give you resources and point you in the right direction and tell you the questions you need to be asking yourself. One of the things that I saw in my last corporate job, and I was working with over a thousand independent contractors. So they were all their own business. They were each an entrepreneur, but affiliated with our corporation. And I saw their struggle with trying to find information online. Sometimes they'd find like free YouTube videos or something else, and they're devouring the information, yet then it conflicts with what someone else says. And so then they don't know, do I do A, do I do B? Having that ability to sit down with someone that you know has the experience, you know that you can trust, and they'll give you undivided personal attention. You know, even the blogs I write are kind of general. Even if it's about a specific business and I'm answering a question, it's not about your business. So having that one-on-one -on -one time to focus on you and your business is well worth what you pay for one hour, <laughs> still at a level that almost every business can afford to invest one hour at a time. That's a great tip. So speaking about things when you started your business, what do you wish someone had told you besides finding your brand voice about being an entrepreneur before you start? Uh, there is no one to tell you what to do, but you. And if you don't have great time management skills, 
uh, or focus, that can be a real, real hindrance for yourself. It's very easy to succumb to the, well, I'm my own boss. I'm going to take the day off today and I'm going to go, you know, check out this festival that's happening downtown and, you know, see what's going on. If you don't have that dedicated time to focus on what does your business need today? What actions can you take to move it forward? How can you build uh, more visibility or, you know, reach out to potential clients? If you are skipping over all of those often, then you're skipping out on your business. You're skipping out on your money. You're skipping out on your dreams. And that is something that uh, I wish someone had told me. Uh, not that I was too bad with it. It was usually more like, oh, it's a Friday. I'm just going to take Friday off. We're going to have a three-day weekend. Or, you know, oh, it's 4.30 and I don't have any more meetings for the rest of the day. I know I planned on working until 5.30, but I'm just going to cut out an hour early. Like every time you're taking that little bit of time away from your business, you're robbing your future self of success that you could potentially have. The flip side of that, I also wish that someone had told me is, to not get overzealous on focusing on the business because I did have, I had both periods. I had the, well, I'm just going to take today off period. And then I had the, I can't take any time off and I have to push, push, push and hustle, hustle, hustle period and burnt out. And so it was like yo-yo dieting, but (laughs) for my business, it was one extreme of work, 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 and then swing back to the other side of it's fine. Like just relax a little. You got to find that happy medium of, and I used to use this term all the time uh, when I had a job was life work balance. You always said work life balance. And I would come back and be like, no, you mean life work balance. I don't work to live. I live to work. And so wait, reverse that. Yeah. You don't want to live to work. (laughs) Right. Yeah. My life comes first was, was the point that I was making to them that, you know, I can always find more work. I can always find more ways to get money, but I can't find another way to get another life if I've squandered it. And so finding that balance, scheduling your time appropriately and making sure that you prioritize what's most important for your business in that given period that you're in uh, will take you farther than, you know, slacking off and cutting out because you feel like you need, you know, a quote, mental health day. That's such a good point. And sometimes when you're moving from any type of corporate job into entrepreneurship, your day was most likely only structured by someone else. Yeah. And it may take some trial and error to find how it works best for for you because most of us have not had the opportunity to explore that. Your boss expects you to be there eight to five, Monday to Friday, and take lunch, talk to one. And so finding our most efficient way to work can be trial and error. And in my case, I've mentioned before that I left a job that had been running 80 hour weeks for about three years. And so when I went into entrepreneurship and I I quit because of that, I was overworked and then we almost died in Paris. And I was like, I'm working on vacation and almost dying. And this isn't working for me anymore. But I knew that I needed recovery time. There's no way I could work at 80 hour weeks anymore. But I also knew that for a while, I probably couldn't work at 40 just because I was exhausted. And so I was running around 20 to 25 hours a week. And I felt so guilty every single day. I felt guilty, yet logically I knew I have to do this to recover. Like you mentioned, when you're not having that extra time to work on your business, your business will feel the impact of that. And so I knew, okay, my business isn't gonna be able to grow as fast as I want it to because I can't put in the hours. Entrepreneurship usually take more than 40 hours a week, just to let anybody who didn't know. It was not quite two years that it took for me to feel like I mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever, had recovered from the overwork to feel comfortable going back to like 40 hour weeks or whatever you'd think would make a normal work week for an entrepreneur. There was one coach I talked to early in that process because we all need coaches for our own business. You need you need someone else, even if it's just to bounce ideas off of. I was explaining to her, you know, the 80 hour weeks. I'm doing 20 right now. I need time to heal. This was maybe six months in. Later that day, I saw that she 
posted on her social media. She she didn't name me. She didn't go into a lot of details about the conversation, but I knew it was about me because she's like, I can't believe that any entrepreneur would think that only working 20 hours a week is okay. That's not going to make you successful and, you know, whatever it said. And I was like, okay, well, that right there, unfortunately, tells me I can't work with her because she doesn't understand. You know, I wasn't saying I'm only working 20 hour weeks and then I'm going to go party the rest of my life away because realistically, I knew I couldn't do that. But like, I was like sleeping. I was focusing on cooking healthy food. I was cleaning my house, you know, I was focusing on all of those types of things that I needed to do to be whole. I found kind of through that, that something that worked really well for me. You've probably heard of like time chunking or the Pomodoro technique. Pomodoro says you spend 20 minutes on a task and then take a five minute break. And then after like three of those, you take a 30 minute break, something like that. I, I'm getting it slightly wrong. I know I am. That didn't work for me because sometimes some of the things I'm doing, like when I'm doing a website, I need a chunk of time to focus. So what I found that works for me is I work 90 minutes on and then 60 minutes off. And I do that three times in a day. That gives me a whole hour to just do whatever I want. I want to go to the store, I go to the store. I want to clean the house, I clean the house. I want to use it to focus on something future for my business. I can do that too. If I want to drop the last chunk out of the day because I need to have a doctor's appointment or something personal, you know, or, you know, go to the art fair downtown, then that's what I would do. But no one had ever taught me that because I was in the corporate world and they would not be okay with you working an hour and a half and then going and taking off an hour because all they can see is, well, you can't do that. That would break productivity. In my case, it's worked very well. You have to do trial and error and think outside of the box to find your most productive self and the systems that will, you know, processes and systems that will support that for you. But entrepreneurship does take usually more time than you would expect, but you also need to be strategic because you do need, you know, I had no work-life balance. It was work, work, work balance. And work-life balance is never equal. It goes up and down. Yep. And as long as you realize that, okay, the work side's going down today because there's something that I want to do that will fill my soul. And that's okay, but that means that tomorrow it's going to go the other way and I need to focus more. Great, just entrepreneur, new entrepreneur tip that you have there. So, so speaking of tips, I want you, I now, want to you now to share so that you have a three-step method to intentionally up-level your style. So very much like we talked about everything today, how it starts with defining what it is you're looking for, right? Whether that be your marketing voice or your you know, time balance. First, you have to define what your style is. I like to use a, um, I guess a suite would be a, a good word or a mix of your style personas. And so if you've ever taken one of those quizzes online, and, you know, they're like, they spit out this one result of like, oh, you're classic. And you're like, okay, cool. Now I have all the answers. I know everything. And you start you're Bohemian Googling. and you're like, oh, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> yeah. You start Googling and you're like, okay, these classic outfits are nice, but like, I'm not going to wear this every day. This is, I don't know what to do with this. And so you're left with like a result an answer, but it's an incomplete answer is what I've found. Most women are a mix of at least five, if not six or more um, style personas. And uh, those can be, well, the, the eight that I use are uh, classic, boho, romantic, urban, or street. I go back and forth on the two because it's inspired by street style. Natural, glam, pregnancy brain fails me and I'm missing the other two at the moment. But you get the idea. They're, you're a mix of all of those things. So first, step one is figure out what that mix is and figure out to what degree you are of each one. To make up your 100% style persona, that might be 50% classic, 25% boho, and another 25% glam. It might be 75% uh, natural and 25% glam. Like whatever mix is you is first and foremost key to figuring out anything before you can move on to step two. Which step two is once you have those, define what they mean to you. Classic can mean very different things to very different people. 
I can say I want a classic dress when I walk into a store and the clerk can walk me over to something that they think is classic and I'm going to go, no, that's not what I meant. But by using more specific terms in the case of classic, two terms that I personally like to use are timeless and uh, sleek. If I walk into the store and I ask someone who's working, you know, I need a timeless, sleek, black dress, they're, that's really going to narrow down what it is that they're going to show me. And it's very specific. So that's step two is to get specific with the information you gathered in step one. And then step three is to take that and apply it to your everyday life. So when you have important events, important functions, even non-important functions, it's just a day at the beach. What is it that you want to feel when you look back at photos, when you check yourself out in the mirror, even just walking down the street, knowing what's on your body? How do you want to feel about that situation? And so you take those key words from step two and apply them to step three when you're looking at the pieces, which I kind of hinted at a little bit in step two, is I create a style sentence and say, I want to look classic. So I will wear pieces that are timeless and sleek. You can add details of like red if you're, you know, very specifically you want to wear something that's red. It's all about defining what it means to you, using that definition of what it means to you to further define the pieces that are going on you and then exuding whatever that um, descriptor is from the inside out, which is why I ended up calling my uh, whole process Mind Your Style because First, you have to address the mind. Second is you, which is all the body and the, the style personas. And then the last bit is the style with knowing how to like mix patterns and colors and uh, all those other fun things. But if you don't have the first part, you can't have the second part. And the third part is going to be a real hot mess if you try to skip over the rest of the other pieces. So those are the three steps. First, define your style personas. Second, define what they mean to you. And third, apply those to your everyday life so that you can intentionally choose what you're wearing for the situations that you really want to show up as your most complete self. I would use hot mess to describe my closet right now. <laughs> and I think part of the problem for me is, you know, you, you take the style quizzes or whatever that tell you, oh, here's your style. And I'm like, it doesn't fit. No one ever really told me that it's okay to have more than one. I mean, I, I lived that, but no one ever said, oh, you can have multiple style personas because when you look in my closet, that's what I have. You know, I have very classic things, which some of it is left over from the corporate career. I have really glam because, you know, I have literal ballroom dance gowns and dresses in my closet. And then I have romantic things that are lacy and flowy. And then I have, you know, boho, like I, my closet is a hot mess of every style, but I've never sat down and kind of thought of them all together, which it sounds like is part of the process that you have. It's like, it's okay to have the different styles, but what does each one mean? You know, I'm just like, oh, well, I like that. And it's a color I like, and it's a style I like, so I'm going to buy it. But I haven't ever like been strategic about putting it all together and really defining how I want to feel in each style. So I think that is like a bit of genius right there. Yeah. And it's just like defining your marketing strategy. Like if you don't know, like we said, which direction you're headed, you never know if you're going to get there. That would be why I'm wearing some crazy shorts. And <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So you have a freebie that you're going to give the audience that I want to talk about in a minute. But before we do that, I want to give you a chance to ask me any question you want about me, about my business, about marketing. If you have a question about marketing that I can help you overcome something you're struggling with right now, this is your chance to get some free advice. Okay. This is very specific and may only apply to me in the universe at this very point in time. And I actually don't think I've mentioned it yet. I am currently seven months pregnant and about to take a bit of a sabbatical. How would you approach marketing for not only the leave of absence to address family issues, but also a triumphant return that positions your business for long-term success rather than like, poof, she's gone. Here she is. Great question. And congratulations. I have five boys and I've got grandkids now and a lot of fun, a great time to be in. And yeah, we won't even talk about style during maternity 
time because back when I was pregnant and having to dress appropriately for work, the only thing you could find was like an ugly dress that would have a bow stuck right on it. Oh. I'm so glad that style has changed. But a couple things I would recommend first, being completely and suddenly invisible from social media or email or whatever marketing methods you're using is a kiss of death to your business. Consistency in those things is important so that people keep seeing you. Having said that, you have the opportunity with almost all of the major types of platforms, email platforms, most of the social media platforms, your website to pre-schedule some things. And if you don't have someone helping you with any of those, like for me, one of the best things I ever did was have my own team take over my social media. <laughs> and I add to it, but I can take a week off now and that doesn't stop. And I don't have to worry about pre-scheduling. It helps keep that top of mind awareness in my audience. They still keep seeing me. Use the pre-scheduling tool to plan out however many weeks you think you're going to be out. Six to eight would be common. Pre-schedule things during that time. It doesn't have to be really involved, complicated, fancy. I've got to make a huge design and I need to make a huge video, but just anything for during that time and get it pre-scheduled so that at any moment, because you could go into labor earlier than you think, you want to be able to kind of have most of the gap filled in so that if you do have to actively do something, maybe it's only in a week here or there or a couple of times that you've got the majority of it pre-scheduled, even if it overlaps and you go into labor later than you think, and you've already got some pre-schedule going, that's okay. You need all that time you can get of not having to worry. You also want to mention it ahead of time, celebrate it in your conversations with your audience. You're going to be going on maternity leave soon. If there won't be any appointments available. Let you know. Let them know that ahead of time. I won't be taking appointments during that time, but I will and I'll be back. If you're still going to keep taking appointments or keep doing work that's already on the book, make sure they know that too. Kind of just so they have an understanding of expectation. Mention it more than one time. It still takes 11 times for someone to see and digest your message. So if you only share it once, you're going to miss a lot of people in the way. I didn't even know you were going out. Start telling them probably now. You've got uh, roughly two months left. You'd want to start ahead of time and making them aware. Then you're going to have your pre-scheduled things on your most important platforms. So don't worry about doing every single platform. Do the ones that you have control over pre-scheduling and that your audience is on mostly. So pick two or three. Make sure you get at least once a week if that's your normal frequency. If your frequency is more than that, Still only doing once a week is okay, but you need at least kind of once a week to keep it fresh in your audience mind. And then when you come back, you can kind of be pre-planning a celebration of that time. Maybe you wait until then to introduce the new baby. Don't try to do it during your rescheduled time. Let it kind of build up to that point. And then with your business audience, obviously your friends and your private connections are going to know that, but let it kind of be a, a nice big celebration and here's information about the baby here's a picture if you're comfortable sharing that if not you can just share something more generic make it a celebration coming back and post a couple times about that you're back another great thing at that point can also be releasing something new whether that's in addition to i birthed a baby i birthed a new program for you it doesn't have to be something big and complicated maybe it's an ebook maybe it's two or three short video course, something that can be fun to re-engage your audience. And you have probably four months to come up with that. If you've got a couple months left in your pregnancy, and then if you pre-schedule out a couple months worth of posts and messaging during that time, you know, you've got still quite a bit of time to come up with that. It doesn't have to be fancy and complicated, but it can be a great way to re-engage and get the people coming back in and downloading and requesting information and that type of thing. It could be a new service level that you offer in any of those things could work. Three steps before, during, after, announce it now, pre-schedule things for later and have a plan for a welcome back. Here's the baby introduced and here's some new small thing that I have for you in celebration. And that's a kind of simple and great way to bridge that time.
in, in a fun way, a fun way to bridge it to. That is fun. I had never considered uh, the returning as a celebration. You, you know, you get so procedural with like, have to do this thing. Okay, and now that I'm off, okay, now I'm back. Like, but no, it really is a celebration. So I am going to carry that theme forward. I really appreciate yeah. that advice. Thank you. Good. I'll be looking forward. I'll be watching it. I'll celebrate with you. <laughs> so speaking of having something new when you return, you have something right now that the audience can go grab your weekly wardrobe planning tool. Tell us about that and how to access it. And I will put the link down in the description wherever anyone is watching or listening. So they'll be able to click, but um, share about that also. Yes. Yeah, so the your weekly wardrobe planning tool is a little worksheet that I devised first to, uh, to keep myself on track because planning is important. It's one of the things that I work through with clients and getting it into their routine. Just like you have a workout habit, you should have a, a weekly wardrobe prep habit. I mine for me that works best on Sunday. I sit down, look over my calendar, see what's happening, check the weather and pull clothes appropriately. And so I took this process that I teach and that I use myself and organized it on paper so that you can sit down with this sheet of paper, pull up the weather, fill in what the temperature is gonna be for the week or the feels like temperatures. If it's in the winter, feels like temperature tends to be more important than what the actual temperature is, depending on you know what your climate is. And then also filling in what events you have. So like we talked with being intentional and using those three steps to really plan ahead for what you want to wear and how you want that to help you feel in those moments this is your opportunity to look at where are those moments or are there no moments and you just want to feel fantastic that day period that's what you put in the little events column and then it walks you through building an outfit outfit specifically for each step so it gives you your base which would be your top and your bottom or you're wearing a dress then your layering piece if you're going to add a jacket or if you need a sweater um it's right now it's the middle of summer so you know, that layering piece um, is probably going to be empty. Unless you're going to the beach and you've got a cover up, that might be a good place to put that. Then you can consider what kind of footwear am I gonna wear? Is this an event where I'm gonna be on my feet for a long time and I need to be comfortable? Is it something that's, you know, super dressy and I will have the opportunity to sit down like a wedding and so I can wear my six inch heels if I really want to. And then last but not least, the finishing touches, which is all your accessories. And you can sit down, fill this in, in about 10 minutes, and then have that on deck so that even if you don't physically go into your closet on whatever night is best for you and pull those pieces aside, you have the plan in front of you to reference and go, oh, that's right, I was gonna wear that today. So when you get up in the morning and you've got 60 things to do and you keep snoozing your alarm because you, know, you were up too late last night working on your business plan, please don't do that you have a plan of at least one thing to handle um, that you don't have to think about before you enter your day. It's already taken care of. And it gives you back not only a little bit of that brain power because our, our brain capacity is limited to make decisions throughout the day. It gives you back that little bit of time. Most clients that I work with tell me they spend anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes each morning trying to figure out what they're going to wear. And you've done that already in one day a week in around 10 minutes, it's good to go. And so are you. That's great. The spoon theory, which a lot of people have heard about, and they have said that Mark Zuckerberg, you always see him in gray t-shirt and jeans, and that's like his work wardrobe so that he doesn't have to spend any of that time thinking about what am I going to wear today? I'll give you how I'm going to go grab this and use it right now. I have two trips coming up both in the near future. And, you know, most of my days since I work from home and since COVID, I have not been doing a lot of in-person events. I used to hold in-person classes on things like setting up your social media or doing a website. And I haven't done any of those because of COVID. So most days I can wear whatever I want. But these trips, I'm always struggling with what should I pack? And even though I'm trying to be super organized, I always pack too much. So I'm going to go download this and print it and use it for my trips so that I'm like, okay, this day we're going to the beach. So this day is a formal night. One of our trips is a cruise. So they always have a formal night and totally plan for my trips. And then the other thing I'm going to do with it, I use a rocket book for my kind of like 
planner, I still have to touch and feel probably because I do so much art. <laughs> yep. The rocket book is erasable and, but they have paper that you can print onto the rocket book and put it in your rocket book. It'll be erasable also with the right kind of pens. And so I'm going to print this onto a rocket book sheet and put it in my rocket book. And then all of my weekly planning, including this new piece is all together. So I love this. It's that's a great idea. And I used to try to kind of halfway plan for the week when I was working corporate, you know, you kind of like, okay, do I have enough suit clean? You know, do I need to take something to the dry cleaner? You know, but do I have five suits available for the week, five pairs of dress slacks, five jackets, <laughs> kind of boring. I never gave much thought to that, but your process combined with this planning sheet, like kind of makes me excited to look into my closet and at least care about what I wear more than yoga pants every day. <laughs> it really <laughs> does the curiosity. And I will tell you also, just because I just did this process for planning for my trip is uh, it allows you to see the holes and what you need. And so I actually started three weeks ago and my, at this point, my trip isn't for two more, two and a half more weeks but it's allowed me the time to see what am I missing? What do I already own so that I'm not unnecessarily purchasing things and wasting money because we're not about wasting resources. Side note, speaking of resources, I love the rocket book. That's beautiful. I use mine as a PDF on a tablet with a capacitive touch pen so I can just erase it and fill it back in every week. And if you don't have either one of those, print it, laminate it and get wet erase markers. Um, so that they're only like, you won't accidentally rub it off. It only gets removed if you use a wet uh, cloth or sponge or something to wipe it down. So those are our sustainability tips for using this tool. Yes, I went through the same process. I looked at how many days I would be gone. I looked at what do I already own that I can take with me? What do I need to add to this um, and make purchases for those? And it really avoids that last minute, like panic purchasing. I used to see that a lot in my retail days of people like, oh, I'm leaving Saturday on a trip and I need a new swimsuit. And it's like, you might've wanted to start looking for that two weeks ago. Swimsuits are the worst. So bonus tip, use it to plan way ahead and save yourself that headache and hassle of uh, panic shopping also. Well, I recently did it in my stories. I talked through this process of planning for my vacation and I'm gonna compile all those little shorts that I had in my stories into a short video um, or a reel um, on Instagram. So I can shoot you the link for that once it's posted. We can share that as well as bonus tip. Awesome. That's great. That worksheet, it sounds so simple. You know, I don't want a worksheet that's going to take me an hour and a half every week to sit down and do. And this sounds so simple and could have so many uses. So I look forward to downloading that. And the link will be shared down in the description again. And speaking of links we share in the description, I want you to share now how our listeners can reach you. And we'll have the links for that down in the description also. But for those listening, go ahead and tell them how they can get in touch with you. Yeah, I spend most of my time on Instagram. I also am on Facebook. I have a private Facebook group where you can interact with me directly, ask me questions. I'm on a summer sabbatical, but normally there are every Friday live uh, sessions on topics of, it really just depends on you know what's happening out in the world, what you're asking for. Um, just a quick little live session to teach you a new thing. And also I'm over on LinkedIn. Great. I'm definitely going to join a couple of those. I need to up my style game as we've mentioned and my crazy closet. <laughs> so any last minute when you're approaching your personal image, and especially in relation to your business, remember that you are the face of the business and the business is not the face of you. So make sure that you represent yourself as the way that you want to be seen as the business owner, not as the business. Great tip. It was so great talking to you and getting to meet you and hear your tips. And I look forward to implementing some of them myself. And for all of our viewers, if you have a marketing question, you can visit our website, vickywoo.marketing. And in the bottom right-hand corner, there's a chat bubble icon. You can ask your question there and I'll answer you directly. And then I may even use your question on an upcoming episode. While you're here, check out our other videos and subscribe to our channel so that you never miss the latest marketing tips.